Life Issues with Vicky Gibbons on UCB1. Today's discussion has been recorded sensitively, but as we draw on the issues of war and mental health, please be aware you may find some of the content distressing. This year marks 40 years since the Falklands War. Located off the southeast coast of America, the group of islands has been part of the British Empire since 1833. But that was disputed by Argentina, and on the 2nd of April in 1982, its forces invaded the British Overseas Territories, which started one of the largest major conflicts since the Second World War. 255 British personnel were killed, and more than 750 wounded. Despite the significant losses across the armed forces, the 74-day conflict is at risk of being forgotten, with a quarter of young people today never having heard of it. I'm Vicky Gibbons, and in Life Issues today, we'll be hearing about the lasting impact for some veterans, as well as later looking at the effects of PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. We're joined first by Commodore Adrian Nance, OBE, and CEO of the charity Wings Like Eagles. He served in the Royal Navy for more than three decades and survived the sinking of HMS Sheffield in the Falklands conflict. Part of the deal for me in joining the Navy was my mother was a veteran, my father was National Service, my mother served in World War II in the Navy, uh, and um, I got the bug for it, I think, more than anything from my maths master at school who was in the Royal Naval Reserve. What were your expectations, preconceptions then before joining? I think I was delightfully naive. I joined uh, the, the Naval College at Dartmouth with my hair on my shoulders and first words I heard in the Navy were, get your hair cut. <laughs> that, that beautiful shock of hair, head of hair, all, <laughs> all suddenly gone. And I mean, I'm a complete novice, so help us understand, because much of your career has been linked, although you've been in the Royal Navy, it's been linked to aviation. Yes, kind of. I think most of my pilot and observer colleagues would turn around and say that's a bit of a sham. Uh, But it's not really, because uh, I just ended up with lots of different encounters with helicopters and aeroplanes from beginning as a junior officer waving those bats that you sometimes see in uh, international airports, those people who wave at aeroplanes and try to tell them where to go uh, at one end of the scale. And at the other end of the scale, I ended up as the captain of HMS Ark Royal. So I got the chance to tell aeroplanes where to go then. You did indeed. Incredible. And so thinking back then to where you first of all started off in training. You said you had this bug, the desire. Was part of it about travel as well, travelling the world, exploring? No, I don't think so. I think that was an add-on that I much enjoyed. But I think a lot of it was about this sense of service. And when I became a Christian, I'd already joined the Navy and I had to really confirm and struggle with my faith to see whether or not I was allowed to be good at being a naval officer or not as a Christian, so being a serving Christian. So that was a more important thing for me than travel. As I understand it, the Falklands was the first time you were serving on the front line. How did that sit with you, knowing that the combat zone was going to be something that you were physically going to be present at? Well, there's sort of three quick bits to that. The first one, which your listeners may not know, is that we do actually have the ability to object in this country on the basis of conscience to serving in combat. Conscientious objectors of World War I have been much decried, uh, but more especially the Quakers and that Christian faith gave us the ability to turn around and discover that if it's genuinely a matter of conscience, somebody can leave. So that's that's one component. The second component to the Falklands was this was a wrong. Somebody taken somebody else's land. And I've had friends turn around and say, we should give it back and all the rest of those sorts of things. Well, 
you can find in history when the Argentines ever had it, please get in touch. So there was a sense of injustice about this, about the people who are living on the island. And also there was a sense of the third thing was that, you know, the Navy and the country had been paying me at that time. And this was my opportunity to do my service for my country. HMS Sheffield was the ship that you found yourself on. Was it one, a vessel that you'd been on many times before? Uh, No, it wasn't. Um, I had joined about six months before we went down to the Falklands and all the ship's company had gone out to a patrol in the Gulf. So we had been away from our families probably longer than most of the people who went into the war zone with us. So we were kind of expecting to be going home. And at Gibraltar, instead of turning right and coming north, we turned left and went south. You knew you were changing course then. What was your experience in the coming days? We had all been trained extensively and um, over quite a long period to get ready for serving our country in this way. So we did a lot of training. We refreshed ourselves. We thought about the sorts of problems that we would encounter. And we tried to find solutions the best way that we could to all of those. And that's kind of what dominated. And as a navigator, the fascinating thing for me was that I had no map of the island that we went to as a sort of intermediate stop. So the um, Ascension Island uh, was a place that I'm not even sure I'd heard of. And the way I found out its latitude and longitude was to go to an atlas and actually measure out in tiny little bits of detail roughly where I thought it would be. So it was quite interesting to try to find the first place. And the Falklands, of course, was a place that I think most of us in the task group hadn't even heard of. So we had to navigate our way to that too. But we were a big group by then, and there were better navigators than me that helped us find it. So there was this sense of tension as we continued south. A sense of tension. Did that build and grow? Did you feel under threat at any point before the 4th of May? Yes. So I think in those days, almost everybody listened to the BBC World Service. The sense of the World Wide Web and being able to find your news didn't exist in those days. So all of us in the task group were listening and bear in mind new groups of ships were joining all the time as different ships were got ready and the army units and the Royal Marine units were brought together and so on. The fleet got bigger and bigger. But during the whole time, I think most of us were hoping that the shuttle diplomacy that was going on, led by the Americans with Uh, Argentina would result in a peaceful solution. And so we wanted that. We wanted this to end peaceably. Um, There was jingoism. Of course, there was. There were some very intemperate um, newspaper articles written and so on in terms of trying to stir everybody up. But I don't think there were many people in the Falklands uh, task group who actually didn't want it all to end peaceably. The British government, I'm sure, was working and taking actions with Argentina uh, in terms of making clear their feelings, etc. So that diplomatic work was going on. There might have been economic work that was going on. Uh, but in the military sense, I don't think anything really happened until we crossed into the total exclusion zone around the Falkland Islands that we established to say, you're not allowed to come in here. And that was on the 1st of May, 1982. If we had Argentinians listening to this, they would say that the first thing that triggered the attack 
uh, that we were part of was the loss of the uh, cruiser Belgrano on the 2nd of May, uh, which was torpedoed by a British submarine. And I think we all on the 3rd and 4th of May were trying to work out what the Argentinians would do next. And we found out they launched a very clever, uh, extremely well-flown attack on the task force with two aircraft, each carrying a single Exocet missile. And uh, they actually didn't fire the missile at the aircraft carriers that we were there to protect. In this case, they fired it at us. So that takes us to just after two o'clock in the afternoon on the 4th of May, 1982. Chaotic scenes, I imagine, then descended. What was happening for you on board that vessel at that time? Well, you've kindly named your series Life Issues, and there are some life issues that were part and parcel of that day. So one of them was that clearly... Uh, we did the best that we could, uh, not the best that was possible to be done, but the best that we could to avoid being hit by it in the first place. Uh, that's a life issue. It's a bit like being in a motorway. Uh, when you're very close to an accident, you kind of want to make sure nobody hits you. Well, there was a bit of that going on. Uh, and after the impact... I think there was a combination of shock and horror and reality dawning. Uh, I don't know whether you find the same, Vicky, but I think all of us can identify with the fact that when you anticipate something, you don't always anticipate it accurately. And when something actually happens, you know, a momentous event like childbirth for a woman, for example, there's lots of anticipation, but the actual event you only know about when it happens. And so there was quite a lot of that for us. And the experience of it, you might argue the trauma or the stress of it, would be a bit like uh, any of us if we lost our house or something that was really precious to us. We lived in the ship, and so it was our house and our home. And so here we were with the, presented with the imminent prospect of losing our home in the middle of an ocean that was cold enough to freeze you to death in about 20 minutes. So there was plenty to think about on that day. The vessel would have been burning at the time. What would have been the evacuation procedures? Because at some point there was recognition that the vessel would have had to have been abandoned. Yes, so there are. Um, I think one of the things we forget as people is how good our memory for smell is. It's perhaps cutest when we remember the smell of our girlfriend's perfume or something like that. And less cute when you remember the smell of a baby's nappy or something. Well, smell is very powerful and the smell that day was uh, unforgettable. The evacuation, um, we kind of don't plan for. What you plan to do is to survive. So the aim is to bring the ship out because the best thing that you can do is to be together in the same place. All survival people say, you know, stay together and try to stay in the same place. And so that's what we were trying to do to preserve the ship, not just because it was our home, but because it was also the best chance for our survival in the very uh, variable weather conditions at the South Atlantic. I think. So what happened next? So we fought this fire. So 
if your kitchen exploded in your home or something, you had a really big fire, then what you try to do, I think, to start with is to put the fire out. And that's what we did. So we spent four hours, four to four and a half hours, trying to put the fire out, discovering that we had tragically lost 20 of our colleagues in the impact and the smoke afterwards, and uh, discovering that the ship was just getting hotter and hotter, the fire was getting bigger and bigger. And because it's a warship, uh, you're on top of something like 500 tons worth of fuel, which you kind of don't want to catch fire if it's in your home. And you're also carrying quite a lot of ammunition. So at some point, you get to that place which you discussed earlier, which is this point of evacuation. Captain decided that we weren't winning, that the metal of the ship was getting so hot that our uh, sea boots were starting to melt and that we, the surviving 280, would have to leave. Two ships had come to our aid by this stage. HMS Arrow, incredibly well handled and trying to put water on the hull to cool it down. And HMS Yarmouth that engaged itself most in trying to stop what we thought was uh, also a submarine attack on the task force at the same time. So most of us ended up either evacuating to Arrow, or I think some went to uh, Yarmouth, and I think some were evacuated by helicopter into other ships of the task force. During the Falklands conflict, there were four British ships that were sunk. How did you respond when you heard what was happening to other colleagues on those vessels? Well, I think to answer that properly, we need to understand a little bit about how they responded to us, because being first in this sort of situation is something that nobody particularly wants to be. And I think both for the task force and its sailors and for the country as a whole, I think the mood on the 5th of May was, this is real. This isn't some sort of glorious computer game that some of us may play where you can push the reset button and start again. This is real. There is no rewind facility on this uh, recording. And the task force as a whole, I think, I can't speak for all of them, obviously, had that sense of the reality of combat. And we inherited from them, as Sheffield survivors, a deep respect for one another as we continue to try and do our duty for the Falkland Islanders who had been invaded, for our brothers and largely brothers in those days uh, in the task force, and for our country. So there was this deep sense of this is costing and nobody can decide who pays. It is costing. You speak of deep respect as well between colleagues. What of the end of the conflict then? I think it's important not to lose perspective since you asked quite a big question. The hardest struggles in the conflict were over the ships that you've mentioned and over the land campaign. The victorious struggles included an air campaign in which our aircraft carriers did an amazing job 
against a land-based air force, in which our special forces did amazing things, in which our submarines did amazing things, in which our amphibious forces did amazing things. And whilst this program rightly being about life issues is perhaps focusing a bit on the things that were really difficult, and I'm not saying those campaigns were easy. These were people who achieved far more than one might ever imagine in that campaign. And it was the combined effort of all of them doing all those things that is what delivered the victory. So what do we feel towards the end? Well, it would be very difficult, and I don't think we should apologize for saying we were quite glad. The Argentine junta, as we found out later, was taking the children of, that had done the invasion, was taking the children of people in Argentina, flying them out over the water and throwing them in the sea. The end of a regime like that surely is worth being glad about. The pictures of the mothers of those children, the so-called disappeared ones in Argentina, um, are all about that expression of how unjust the regime was. So it's rather a long answer. Sorry for that. But we were glad. We were glad it was over. We were glad the Falkland Islanders could have their land back. We were glad, each of us that had survived, that we'd made it. What of post-traumatic stress and your understanding of this and the questions that were since raised, including in courts, as to the aftercare for those who served during the Falklands conflict? I think this is really tough for us as a country. Uh, I watched the film Patton relatively recently. And uh, in World War II, General Patton was castigated by his country, quite rightly, for saying there's no such thing. That post-traumatic stress is cowardice. Our country has evolved a long way since then. And of my colleagues and their spouses, their families. Uh, we're in a much better place now. But the three issues of post-traumatic stress that are most lively in my mind are that things can be unforgivable, that you may not be able to forgive yourself or other people, that things are unpredictable, you can't tell when it's going to creep up on you. And that things are unknowable. You don't know. You don't recognize yourself and your reactions sometimes. You don't recognize the reactions of your friends because they're behaving so out of character. Those would be my looks at post-traumatic stress. And I've tried to talk about that in as sensitive a way as I can with friends of mine who have lost, with the relatives of those who have lost friends, etc. Do you think your personal faith has impacted how you have processed that experience on HMS Sheffield? Uh, I'm glad you used the word personal there because I think that's so important in this era. Faith is a very personal thing, but some of the truths are more widely applicable. So for me, as a committed Christian, the fact that Christ forgives me, that in Christ God can forgive me, help solve the unforgivable part of post-traumatic stress. The fact that 
Jesus knows me and loves me and has counted the hairs on my head, helps solve the unpredictable part of the way that I behave sometimes. And the unknowable, I think, um, has, is helped by the fact that Jesus makes this comment that the day's own trouble should be sufficient for the day. But sometimes we try to carry burdens we just can't. So in all of the three ways, as I described, post-traumatic stress, I find my faith helpful. Commodore Adrian Nance, OBE, thank you very much for spending this time with us. It's a pleasure. So what about those individuals who continue to carry those burdens and who shy away from seeking support? Dr Walter Bussertil served in the medical branch of the Royal Air Force. He's a visiting professor at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience at King's College London and is currently Director of Research and Training at the charity Combat Stress. Preparedness and all these kind of concepts uh, are only fairly recent in terms of military psychiatry. I know because I served in the military myself. I was trained as a military psychiatrist. So before the Falklands War, really, people weren't that prepared um, uh, in terms of mental health and their psychology of fighting a war. They were well trained, of course, um, uh, and then progressively after Gulf War One, and certainly you know after Bosnia and uh, and the Balkans, uh, the, the the people have been much more proactive in in uh, preparing uh, combatants in particular, but also all the others who've served in the military in the war zone uh, in relation to uh, psychological well-being and mental health. And certainly, that's one of the biggest achievements I think of the um, uh, military in the UK. Uh, following Iraq and Afghanistan, where there's much more awareness, and that's really, really positive. And of course, there's also much more awareness in the individuals, but also in their families, so their wives, uh, their, their their spouses, if if it's a, a female um, uh, combatant or someone who's been, if you like, deployed to a war zone. Um, uh, there's much more awareness that you know mental health symptoms can occur if you've been deployed. From a, from a psychiatric point of view, um, uh, there's a whole host of issues that can occur. So first of all, people can be exposed to terrible things in a combat zone, but uh, most people don't end up having a mental health problem long term. That's really important to emphasize. Some people can break down even before they arrive there, just knowing that they're going there. Uh, some break down when combat actually starts, so when the bullets start flying, and some break down when everything's over and they haven't really afforded uh, the luxury of breaking down, they break down later on. We call these combat stress reactions, and they are transient reactions. So these are uh, th- these are episodes where people can't function, don't function, they're emotional, they may become very withdrawn, they may, be- may become aggressive, or or, uh, or else, you know, they they maybe are dissociating, they're not quite there, they're, they're feeling, they're in an unreal space. And really, most of these uh, individuals uh, with um, uh, support, uh, listening, basics like, you know, a good, good night's sleep, a bit of uh, sedative um, uh, medication, uh, most of these uh, individuals uh, and conditions revert to normal spontaneously with a bit of help. But that isn't the case for everyone, is it? In, in, the, in the minority, some people can get stuck. So when we talk about uh, mental health breakdown in the war zone, it's, it's really not, not the kind of majority of people who have a long-term problem, but some can. Some can actually develop an adjustment disorder, which we'll talk about in a second, or depression or anxiety. Uh, some go on to abuse alcohol, and some may develop post-traumatic stress. So an adjustment disorder, by definition, you're adjusting to a difficult situation that confronts you, once that situation is alleviated, you revert back to normal, and the symptoms usually are anxiety and depression. Post-traumatic stress disorder is a condition that people think is, oh yeah, a serious mental health problem. Well, it can become a serious mental health problem, but actually its basis is very um, uh, easy to understand. So when we're exposed to something horrific, what tends to happen is our mind suspends operations. All it does is it functions to survive us to run away or to fight back or to freeze and die effectively 
Um, but the rule is the mind needs to process all the information that uh, it has been presented with. And that means the facts of what's happening, the emotional uh, feelings we have at that time, and also the sensations, what we see, touch and taste um, uh, at that time. That goes into one bundle, one particular part of the brain, which is called the amygdala. It's like a fuse box. And then that processes all the information and then it goes into a hard drive called the hippocampus. And that's how we lay a memory. So we're laying memories right now, what we see, touch, taste, our emotions now, and the fact we're sitting here having a chat. What happens if somebody has been totally shocked is that doesn't happen right away. It happens later on. And what tends to happen then is people get re-experiencing of the trauma. So they get intrusive memories, nightmares, flashbacks. Their body remembers as well. So if there's a reminder, they may become very, very anxious with palpitations and sweating. Uh, and emotionally, they may get very upset. So that's the first core symptom cluster of PTSD, re-experiencing of the trauma. The second core symptom cluster then is hyperarousal and emotional numbing. And the reason for that is because everything's so upsetting, our mind, our brain, in fact, the amygdala, which we've talked about, a second ago, shuts down. It doesn't work properly, can't process information. And we get stuck, uh, feeling very uptight, hypervigilant, looking out for signs of danger, can't concentrate, can't sleep properly, being irritable, angry, aggressive for no reason. And we feel emotionally numb because the worst has already happened. Good news, big deal. Bad news, big deal. So what? And then we kind of end up feeling hyper and emotionally numb as a kind of... Uh, normal. It's normal for us. And this is the second core symptom cluster. The third sort of core symptom cluster is avoidance. So then we learn the best way to cope with everything is to avoid anything to do with the trauma, any reminders or triggers, any noise that might or smells or uh, the uniform or any kind of situation that causes us stress because then avoidance generalizes. And avoidance then is the third symptom cluster. And then of course, the more we avoid, the less likely it is we can confront what happened and process the information. If we can't process, we get our re-experiencing symptoms again. So PTSD is a revolving um, uh, scenario where we have re-experiencing of the trauma, hyperarousal and emotional numbing and avoidance. And of course, in our culture, the best way to avoid is to use alcohol. Uh, some people use cannabis, so alcohol and drugs are, if you like, a secondary comorbid problem. And then it becomes more difficult to start treating because uh, we push people away. We might uh, become, if you like, difficult at home. We might lose our relationships. We might lose our, our job. We might then become homeless. There are a lot of things then that are, are ramifications. What can be done to stop that spiral? You mentioned treatment. The essential treatment, when it boils right down to it, is to confront what happened uh, in a safe place. That is essentially it. So with therapy, there are kind of phases. So it's, it's very easy to think about. So the, the, the first phase would be all about uh, stabilizing your, your, your individual, making sure they're not drinking. If they are, you need, maybe you need to treat that. If they're depressed, maybe you need to treat that too. If they haven't got housing, maybe you need to find that for them. Uh, they need to be educated in terms of their symptoms for them to have this basic explanation and also some skills training, so psychoeducation, skills training. Some will need medication. Some medications can reduce PTSD symptoms in their own right. Uh, say, you know, less nightmares, sleeping better, less anxious, that's really helpful. Some will also help with their comorbid depression, for example. So that's useful to treat because what's going to kill you is the depression. That's why you're going to commit suicide. It's not necessarily the PTSD itself. And then after you stabilize the, the individual, you, you need to kind of sell the fact that they're going to have to return to normal life eventually. So there's a rehabilitation kind of stance throughout this um, uh, phasic process. So people will need to re-engage in life. And that's where we're, we're living now in the present, not in the past. Of course, this PTSD keeps you in the past because things are stuck like a broken record. And then, of course, the, the actual treatment is psychological and it's trauma-focused therapy. So it helps us to confront what happened the facts, the sensations, and the feelings, and then and now, and the emotions. So, you know, we have barriers to getting getting better. So feeling guilty that I survived, my friend didn't. Feeling guilty I should or shouldn't have done something uh, that caused something else, perhaps, maybe not. Maybe it's an overvalued idea I have. Um, uh, feeling ashamed for what happened. 
uh, uh, and, and that's a, a big barrier. So the, the therapist needs to be skilled enough to identify these barriers, but also to help the individual to process the information. So the commonest uh, modes of treatment we use in the UK are trauma-focused cognitive behaviour therapy, which is just as I've explained it. Uh, the, other, the other process is called eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, or EMDR. Uh, th there are other ways to treat this. If people don't want to talk about it, they can write about it. Uh, there's a biological explanation as to why that works, which I'll explain in a minute. Uh, they can record it in a, in a tape uh, machine and then listen to it many times and expose themselves to it. So the amygdala, of course, where the, the fuse box that blows, as it were, next door to it, there's the speech center. And next to that, there's the narrative center where we kind of learn how to write and to speak respectively. And of course, the, the expression, uh, I was speechless. That's why we have that expression, because... Not only does the amygdala not function properly, but these centers around it can't function properly either. So people can't even tell us exactly what happened because they are speechless. They, they haven't processed any of it. What I'm saying is, actually, PTSD isn't difficult to treat. What is difficult is to overcome this huge avoidance that people have. People are afraid to confront the worst thing that has happened in their life. And of course, they're ashamed to admit there was a problem. Uh, especially if they're uh, in the military, we're all macho in the military, uh, there are big stigma issues, we're trained to look after ourselves and to sort our own problems out, not ask for help. So what makes you a really good soldier makes you, if you like, a, a, a rubbish patient, somebody who doesn't want to ask for help, somebody who feels even while you're serving in the military that your sergeant or, or your officer is going to um, uh, uh, laugh, you know, make, make fun of you. Mm. Uh, that's improved a lot, I think, in the last, uh, certainly the last 10 years, uh, from my, my knowledge uh, about how the military operates now. It's a, it's a lot less uh, of a problem. Stigma is still present, but it's highly, highly uh, improved, uh, definitely improved. So, Dr. Bussettil, if we think specifically about the Falklands War then, because I've heard some veterans express that the idea of PTSD, the idea of even accessing any kind of support from the military, very much they were shunned at the time and continue to be those who served part of a forgotten war, forgotten victims, which just goes to reinforce the invisible wounds that, of course, PTSD is so much a part of. Is there a correlation between in terms of accessing support early and reducing the level of impact on someone's individual life? Because I see that on average, it takes a veteran about 14 years to ask for help after leaving the service. Yes, I think that's a very important point. It is easier, relatively easier to treat or to get somebody in the right window of opportunity to actually disclose in a safe environment with, with his therapist or her therapist uh, what exactly has happened. Having said that, I mean, I've had some very surreal experiences in my clinical life, as it were. I've been uh, dealing with PTSD since about 1989, so it's, I'm 62 now, so it's, it's a, a very long time. Uh, and one surreal clinic, I had a very young boy brought in by his father, who was, he, he was aged, the boy was aged 19, he just left the army, he'd served in Afghanistan, he had PTSD, quite severe, due to the combat there. The next patient... Uh, the son brought the father. The father was 93, and he was a Second World War tail end Charlie, so a Lancaster um, uh, bomber machine gunner. He had PTSD, and his wife had died six months previously. She'd contained everything for him. Social support, very, very important as well. But the treatment was exactly the same. They both did well. The, dif the difficulty other people have, perhaps, is not being able to engage. So both wanted to engage and both wanted treatment, but, and the intervention was exactly the same. Now, what we found, certainly at Combat Stress, and uh, we have a, a quite a big uh, research department now, we, we looked at uh, our veterans and their needs, their clinical needs, and uh, one of the studies looked at how quickly people were coming after leaving the military, coming for help. Um, with the Falklands uh, and Northern Ireland, it's around 14 years after leaving the military, irrespective of how long before that they've been traumatised. So that's many, many years. With the newer wars, with Afghanistan and Iraq, respectively, it's two years and four years after they leave the military. And that's because of much, much better education. Of course, after the Falklands War, there was the class action. I don't know if you know, 400 veterans sued the MOD because they, they, they alleged that there wasn't enough education beforehand and certainly no help afterwards. 
And, uh, you know, the MOD then uh, had to change quite a lot of, of, of what they did. Uh, the class action, in fact, wasn't successful. Uh, but the MOD then set up a research department at King's, uh, the King's Centre for Military Health uh, Research, which at least, at least now we have a handle of what the problems are. Uh, and, and now we also have better treatments. But the Falklands veterans have been forgotten. I have a, I mean, I, I'm still a, a, a clinician uh, seeing patients every week. Some of my patients are Falkland veterans. They're still suffering. Some of them haven't been able to come to terms of what happened or find a safe place to be able to do their therapy. And that's, in a way, is tragic. And certainly, uh, if and when they're able to, then my, my kind of not even optimistic view, my view would be that they can improve quite a lot. And what about triggering then, particularly thinking of all that is in the news at the moment with Ukraine and Russia? Yes, it's a big problem. I mean, uh, I joined the Air Force when I was uh, 21 in 1981, and uh, I was trained as a Cold War uh, per- person, as it were, so as a doctor and then as a psychiatrist. And of course, the Falkland veterans were all trained for the Cold War. This is our war. Now, many of my current patients this week, last week, in the last few weeks have said to me, we are very upset about what's happening in Ukraine. This is the war we trained for. It is a tank battle. They're using uh, uh, military hardware we, we, we know about because we were trained on this. It hasn't really been upgraded. So the Russians haven't really upgraded. So in a way, they are very, very frustrated that they haven't been able to go out and do the, the job they're trained to do. And I know that some actually have done, not my patients, but I know some have done. Uh, and they've been very upset at the war and the scenes of the war. The other, the other veterans who are, in effect, as well, Cold War veterans and would have served in the Falklands as well, are the ones who served in Bosnia and the, and the Balkans, because the actual images of the refugees and the The images of the war are very similar to what happened in the Balkans. And that's really big, big triggers for them and members of their family. So I think, as you can imagine, I I personally have been very busy um, uh, since this war started. Thinking, uh, of course, across your career as well, there have been so many changes and you've included responses from the Ministry of Defence as well. I just wonder, should it be down to the NHS and charities and organisations like yourselves to be providing the care that is clearly still required for many veterans, or whether there should be a greater role picked up in terms of the Ministry of Defence when it comes to the legacy of such conditions? Well, I, I'm, I'm not a politician, but look, we didn't have an Office of Veterans Affairs until two or three years ago. Now we do, and they've expanded their staff. So I'm really, really pleased with that. I must remember a trip I made to Australia in 2001, where we were in the Australian Veterans Affairs Office, and we had the Americans, the Canadians, and the British there. I'd left the Air Force by then, and we happened to be at a conference, and we were invited. And this was all about sharing what each government did for veterans, and we 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 couldn't say anything. It was just it was really pathetic. But now we 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 actually have a veterans minister who's part of the cabinet, which that that hadn't happened. We we only have had a veterans minister since around 2009. We we you know we were really kind of in the doldrums. So things have definitely improved. We do need um, uh, uh, much better coordination. Uh, we do have uh, bodies like the Contact Group, which coordinate service providers, including charities, the NHS and the MOD, as to what clinical services and the quality of clinical services that are delivered. I chair that quality uh, group. It's, it's run as well by the Royal College of Psychiatrists. So things are very serious now. I wrote a paper two years ago, uh, maybe three about uh, amalgamating all these clinical services. So the MOD, the NHS, and the third sector into one clinical service for serving personnel. So you have the clinicians in uniform at the front, and then people like me at the back, as it were, who are now civilian treating the veterans. And of course, we won't lose the pool of knowledge because what's also important to recognize is the military has contracted quite a lot. When I was in the military, we had 17 senior psychiatrists uh, in the Air Force in uniform. Now, I don't think there are 17 senior psychiatrists in uniform across the whole MOD. And, uh, of course, the numbers in, in the military have, have contracted. So we do need, if you like, to conserve the training pool of knowledge 
and to learn more and of course for experience to be if you like uh, available across the board so I'm, i am optimistic about the future and um, uh, it, it has not been an easy uh, ride as it were and there have been difficulties the falkland veterans should be proud that they actually made the difference without them them and especially the uh, class action i don't think that have made we wouldn't have made so so much progress uh, and and really they have suffered they really have suffered i i would encourage anyone who's a falkland vet- veteran listening to this to come forward for help even now it's still worth it you you can still improve if you come forward for help during the 40th anniversary in the summer of the end of the Falklands war how will you be reflecting well i was very fortunate that in 2007 i was the clinical lead for a pilgrimage that went to the falklands for the 25th anniversary that was a very moving um experience we we they paraded we we walked the battlefields as well and people kind of reminisced as to what happened and people were able to piece things together that they hadn't realized you know oh i was there or oh, were you there could, could you see what happened why did i get wounded so all all of these um uh, memories really will be really quite uh, important for me equally the stories the falkland islanders said how how brave our soldiers were how much they appreciated it how they thought that caused many of our soldiers to get injured and, and maybe even dead because the way we fought in the falklands was three or four people would move forward in a section the others would drop down then other people would stand up and move forward it all all the people dropping down had been shot in casualties in particular when uh, uh, one of the regiments was saving the uh, civilian uh, women and children from a uh, church i think at goose green uh, those those they were absolutely shocked to find out actually nobody died saving them but they they thought for 25 years people had so those would be my memories i, I was lucky to uh, visit the falklands and spend 5 months there in 1984 85 as part of the raf uh, stanley uh, carder as it were so the falklands a very beautiful place uh, was the war worthwhile yes i think you know all the falkland islanders would say they the veterans saved their lives and saved their culture and saved the way they live and, and really they they are they're british by well, for all intents and purposes there's very little difference so i i i do think i will be thinking very much about uh the trip in 2007 i'll also be thinking about my my veteran patients who I've treated many uh, Falkland veterans some of whom were very unwell some of whom made very very remarkable improvements and recoveries and they were all very very brave uh, and you never imagine that uh, they could actually suffer a mental health problem in fact the first ever patient I saw with post traumatic stress was a Falkland veteran my boss uh, Gordon Turnbull when I was in the air force I was a very junior psychiatrist said to me your first job now is to assess this patient he's got uh, a trauma from the falklands war and i said bah. i was coming from a very macho fast jet environment as a gp trainee first and then a qualified gp retraining in psychiatry i said this guy is just be swinging the lead won't he and actually i was so shocked i was so shocked and uh, that was my conversion so i've got everything uh, my whole career um, uh, that i owe to not only this individual but also many falkland veterans Dr. Walter Bussetill, Professor of Psychiatry and Director of Research and Training at the Charity Combat Stress. Thank you for sharing your experience and expertise with us. Look. Four decades on, we can ensure this isn't a forgotten conflict by taking time to remember the sacrifices made by the Falklands veterans and the consequences of conflict they live with today. If you've been affected by any of what has been shared in Life Issues today, Support can be easily accessed online at combatstress.org.uk. Until next time, thank you for joining us and make sure you subscribe to the series or access more episodes for free via the UCB Player app.